Hey, 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 y'all. Tommy here at Storage Pug. Welcome to another amazing episode of Gap Focus. Today, I've got a guest co-host, Josh. How in the world are you, man? Doing good. Surviving all the all the germs swirling around the house. But, uh, you know, thankfully on the webinar, nobody's, you know, I'm not contagious. So don't worry. Can't touch each other on the That's webinar. Right. That's right. Uh, but Melissa, I, I, I know you're listening in the background. And when you're listening to this on the podcast later, uh, just know that we love you and we miss you dearly. Uh, but Josh is going to do his best to fill those shoes. Do my best. <laughs> but y'all, welcome to another fantastic episode of Gap Focus. Today, thank you, Tyler, 46th episode, which is really crazy. Second of the year. Wow. Uh, we're going to talk about marketing in slow markets. And I, and I do want to, I want to spend like 12 seconds putting a giant asterisk next to slow here, right? We're not talking slow like 2005 slow. <laughs> We're talking like it looks like 2019, right? So we're just not the we we've left 2022, we've left 2021. So slow is relative here. So we're not like sad about cell storage. It's just like things are a little different. We actually have to work a little harder <laughs> than we did the last couple of years. So I do want to put that asterisk out there. Uh, but I do want you to meet my guests. I've got two of the coolest people in cell storage talking about marketing today. Uh Heather, how are things down in sunny Florida today? It's good. It's better days. It's uh, it was cold, but it's been quite nice. <laughs> well, Heather, I'm so glad to have you on on board here. I've, we've known each other for years. Uh, Heather, you've been in the storage business since what 2017. Yeah. Uh, so, in uh, in case you all didn't know, in addition to like running the show over at Spacebox Storage, Heather also is the executive director of the Mississippi Storage Association. So, I don't know how you do it. Uh, what is your secret sauce? Uh, I have a great boss and mentor, Corey. He's been fantastic helping me through everything. Corey is one of the cool dudes in cell storage, no doubt. Uh, speaking of cool people in cell storage, my other guest today, Stacy Maxwell. So I learned this fact just a moment ago, and I want to share it with the world. 23 years in cell storage, all with the hat lady. Uh, yes. How in the world did that happen? And, and what is, what's the secret sauce? Um, I think we both just got really lucky. Uh, I said I started working for her at a self storage facility as a manager and um, kind of enjoyed it and and uh, felt like you know when business slows down then you know you have to do something to increase traffic and so I started uh, I have an art background art history background art education background so I started using those skills to kind of reach out and market to the community and um, you know years later here I am uh, corporate office. VP of marketing and training because art art background and education background. I use both of those skills uh, in self storage. It's kind of interesting. It is um, interesting. And, and I've been mentored and taught by the best. I mean, you know, I, I actually am able to get under the hat with her quite often. So it's it's a blessing. She wrote the book on it. So she did. She did. That's right. <laughs> and it's on Amazon. Uh, so y'all, I, I can't wait to like dive into it. We've got a, Josh mentioned it during lobby talk that whoa, the agenda is beefy. We got we got a lot yeah, of, uh, of a questions. Lot. Uh, to get into. So I don't want to hold us up any further. Gap Focus is brought to us by uh, there are two lovely teams here in East Tennessee, Affordable Storage Guys Management and Storage Pug. Josh, of course, uh, runs the show over there with Melissa. And Josh, you've been with Affordable Storage Guys three, going on three, four years? Uh, just about three years. Just about three years. And yeah. I've been with Storage Pug since the beginning of Storage Pug since 2017. Uh, and so I can't wait to, to really like hear from what Heather and Stacy got to talk about when it comes to marketing and also maybe share a little bit of tidbits from what we know as well. If this is your first time at Gap Focus, by the way, uh, the setup is simple. We're going to go for about an hour. It's a QA. and a uh, And so Josh and I, our job is very simple. We ask the questions. Heather and Stacy have the real jobs here where they have to actually answer the questions. Uh, and uh, by the way, not only do we have pre-submitted questions, I want you to put your live questions in the Q&A tool with uh, Zoom. So today's agenda, these are the topics. We're going to talk about diagnosing your market. We're going to talk about the baselines of marketing. We're going to talk about not only digital stuff, but what about physical and old school guerrilla tactics, which is why I wanted Stacy to come on here because her company does a really good job with some of those things. We're going to do live Q&A. And of course, we've got question of the week. So guests, are y'all ready? Sure. Well, welcome to Gap Focus, y'all. Josh, you want to start us off with the first question? Yeah, and I'm I'm excited about these because I, I have a lot of uh, facilities underneath me and I I'm really curious what you guys are going to say to all this stuff. So let's start off. First one, 
Um, what kind of move outs, move ins, and occupancy are you seeing at your stores? And is there a consistent uh, slowdown everywhere? Or are you just seeing it in certain markets? Chase, do you want to go first? Um, sure. Yeah. So uh, we are seeing a general slowdown um, in overall activity, not just move ins, but also move outs. People, you know, they're staying steady. Um, I think think some of it has to do with everyone's a little nervous about the economy right now and what it's going to do. And uh, most people just kind of sit tight and shelter in place, whatever they're doing right now, that's what they're doing. So um, they're not going to move in anywhere. They're not going to move out anywhere. The housing market slowed down, you know, um, so that they're kind of waiting to see what's happening. Their interest rates have gone up. So that's prohibitive to people buying houses and moving, um, but kind of a general slowdown overall. And we've got, um, we manage in 14 different states. And so every market is a little different, but yes, a, an overall slowdown. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's uh, move-ins have been slower. We've seen a bit more move-outs than um, what we've kind of seen this time of year, I suppose. You know, normally it's spring cleaning, but it's kind of people are getting their homes back into order after um, kind of everything. And so a little bit more stagnation for mm. the general population but that's why there's marketing you can kind of change it up a little bit change people's views yeah so like for context so uh heather how what markets and what states do you, are y'all in just for context for our attendance because we have people joining from all over the country and and some folks internationally as well what markets you're in and then same question to stacy just for everyone's context yeah, so we cover four states, Florida, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Louisiana. Um, we have both rural and urban mm. um, going on with those. And so it's in general just kind of slow, but you can kind of gauge some people and bring them back on board slowly. <laughs> I agree. Um, for us at Universal, we're in uh, Alabama, California, Colorado, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia, and a mix of urban and um, rural as well. Um, I, I did read that off of a list. So I <laughs> guess you're wondering. <laughs> It's that I've been everywhere song. Uh, yes. Is that, is that yeah. the list you just read off of? Um, <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so everywhere so, except these states. There we go. And and Josh, just for I mean, affordable storage guys. I mean, y'all just crossed thirty locations earlier this year. So what markets and what states are y'all in? Just so the audience can get a feel for, um, you know, when we're providing context uh, where they. Yeah, fit. we're uh, we're in three states now: uh, Florida, Tennessee, and Kentucky. We are at thirty-five stores as of last week. Um, and that seems like that's always changing. And we're mostly in the tertiary uh, markets. So, okay. um, and I, I just, uh, I maybe a follow up question. I think we maybe get this a little bit later too. But uh, as you guys are diagnosing your market, are you comparing numbers based on last year? This time, are you comparing based on pre COVID numbers? Uh, what What are you using to gauge like, oh, this is just the usual spring? you know, the, the winter slowdown versus, whoa, this is something that we really need to focus on. Yeah, so it's difficult on, somewhat on our end, because a lot of our facilities are newer, uh, they're new builds in the areas that we have. And so we don't have, you know, a, a, a plethora of data to look at. Um, but, you know, thankfully, with experience from other facilities, and then competitor tracking, you know, making sure you're checking on spare foot just to Kind of dig into some other numbers and see what generally you know that's why you make friends because you can kind of see what everyone else is kind of looking at what they used to be at yeah and i i agree we we look at both actually pre-covid and during covid numbers we know that covid numbers kind of inflated things because people had to make room for home offices and um we used a lot of storage for that um we saw the same thing when the housing market kind of crashed in 2008 mm. and we had a huge boon on storage then. Um, and that's the first time in my, you know, history and self storage that I really saw um, self storage itself being not recession proof, but resi recession resistant or resilient. Um, so that was, that was nice, but it, it's nice to watch those trends over time. We had the luxury of, of checking. I mean, we've got compiled data back to 2000. So uh, we can go back and look at those trend lines and see the ups and downs. And um, what we're feeling right now is more like 2018, 2019 numbers. 
So um, I think we're, you know, getting out of that funky peak from COVID and getting back into normal trends for yeah. sure. I mean, for, for those of us who are in this room who uh, got to be part of 2008 in the self-storage business, uh, like Stacy here, like <laughs> you mentioned it. I mean, that was the first time where the tides rose and it stayed risen, right? Because historically, yeah. self-storage occupancy was like 78, 80%. And then 2008 rolls around and everything got up to 90s and it kind of stayed in the 90s. All the way through to now, right, where we saw the REITs in quarter four of 2022 at like 94, 95 percent occupancy. And that was just normal. Uh, right. And it, where if you saw those numbers in the early 2000s, you're like, whoa, what's the secret sauce? Right. right. Um, but as it relates to, to diagnosing here. Right. So, like, how do you know, like, is it an issue with my marketing or is it an issue with my market and the demand? Right. How do you know? Like, how do you how do you just. How do you know which one's the problem child that I need to focus on? Um, what I do is I teach all of my managers to make friends with their competition in the market and call your friend and say, hey, how's it going for you guys? Um, you know, is uh, are you releasing, you know, I don't need to know your exact numbers. They don't have to share the details. They don't have to share the secret sauce. But, you know, is it is it going well for you guys or is it going slowly? And um, by checking in on your competition to see, if they're all so slow, then you can kind of decide whether or not it's a me or it's a everybody mm. kind of issue. Yeah. It's really smart. I definitely agree. Just in general, it's, you know, making sure you're in with your manager, you understand what they're saying because they, I mean, they live there. They also know in general what that area is. And so making sure that they're, you know, double checking their area, double checking and making, making friends, making network connections. I love that. So, mm -hmm. so let's stay on that topic for a second, right? So like, be friends with your competitors. I love that already. Checking them, calling them. Hey, how are you doing over there? Like, give me the, you know, give me the, give me the rundown, right? What are some of the other things you're, you're checking or doing when you're feeling a little bit slow, right? Uh, what have you been doing this year? It's, it's March 30th. You've had three months. What have you been doing this year uh, when things feel a little bit slower than usual? So one of the first things we'll do, we use um, the district manager program. And, you know, that one, Paul Darden built it, I believe. Um, but we'll look in Paul and you can look in the cockpit charting inside that and check each of your stores and see the trend line of occupancies. And when things start to kind of flatten out or even dip down, then I'm kind of like, okay, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my web team. Okay. I need y'all to do an analysis of my website, see if there's anything weird going on. Um, how am I ranking in search results relative to, you know, what's going on in the market as well. So I'll get some data from that. And if that all checks out, then I go to the store level and say, okay, are my prices in line with my competition in the area? Or are we just getting our butts kicked because somebody's got a good special, you know, what's going on there. Um, and I ask my managers how their competition are doing. Are they all also slow um, and just kind of start checking through a list of, of things. Okay, let's start at the top of the things that I manage that, you know, the website at the corporate level. And then, you know, I'll check on marketing efforts at the store, check against the competition and then go from there. Yeah, it's definitely just checking the numbers, uh, checking financials of like what your ads are doing, how often, if you can check those, you know, I think Corey checks things daily just because he needs to have that information constantly. But in general, you should be checking, you know, weekly or monthly at the very least to know, you know, you want to get ahead of the slow, you know, change your marketing or change what you got before it actually fully gets too slow. How much do you look at um, things outside of self-storage to judge your market? I mean, do you do you look at economics, the housing market? Uh, how much of a factor do those play into your diagnosis? I look into that quite a bit, actually. I try to stay on trend. I've got several friends that are realtors, so I pick their brains as well. Um, if they've noticed any trends in the housing market as well, for sure. Because it all plays, in, it plays a big part into it as mm -hmm. well. Um, you can also look at um, how many new businesses you can check with your um, local city or county, whatever, and ask how many new businesses have come online or how many businesses have closed recently um, to get an impact of, or an, an idea of the impact of, you know, are we having growth in this area or are we petering out or are we flatlined, you know? Right. Yeah, it's going back to the managers of 
you know, checking what they have. Usually if they're part of the Chamber of Commerce for their area, that mm -hmm. is a great tool to find out what is going on, you know, because of yeah. course there's definitely realtors there, you know, making friends with moving companies, anything like that. They know what's going on. Yeah, I think those are such good tips. I think staying close with your realtor friends is a really smart thing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we all know people buying and selling houses is a big part of big driver for demand for self storage, right? And uh, with interest rates uh, climbing up very rapidly over the last six months, uh, people have been like, you know what, maybe I don't need to buy that house. Uh, right. Or I can't afford to not that I don't need to is that I can't afford to right. Yeah. Uh, and so my realtor friends, uh, some of them struggle bust a little bit in the last few months, they haven't sold as many houses as they thought they would. Uh, and so if houses aren't being sold, people aren't needing to move, right, uh, and, and get storage. So I think that's a really good, Josh, that's a great question, man. I think that's a really cool outside of the industry thing that drives demand for our services. Yeah, well, you hear that a lot in when you talk to brokers. And I, I mean, even at the recent SSA show, there's a lot of talk about the housing market driving that. So mm -hmm. um, as far as your marketing, like just the basics of, of what you're doing, what are your just going into the basics here. I mean, what are your go-to marketing tactics? What are the channels? What are the, the basics that you are focused on that are important for your business? Um, I would think what is important is, you know, hiring and training the right manager, making sure not necessarily putting them in an uncom uncomfortable position, but putting them, you know, outside of what they think is their normal because it's not just storage anymore. It is learning, putting, you know, feet to ground of like knowing your area, knowing um, what type of social media will affect, you know, if it's a small town, big town. Um, Chamber of Commerce is huge. And so that's one of the big things along with finding out what the specials are. <laughs> right. So um, I agree with that completely. Uh, we use, uh, in terms of finding out what your specials are with your competition, we use a tool called the Rate Scraper. It's something that we've kind of engineered. Um, ah. we, uh, you can you can um, get that from a couple of different vendors, but um, uh, every single day, each of my stores receives a kind of a snapshot of their market of how their store compares to the other stores from scraping rates and specials and prices from other competitions, websites, and ours. And so we align it together and it's color coded. Uh, we do get ours from store track. Tommy just popped that in there. Um, it's, it's a great product. Um, but that helps you know whether you're in line with pricing. Um, sometimes pricing can change even from that snapshot because it's taken, you know, one time a day. So it's good to check back on it if, if you're feeling slow. Um, but as far as basics of marketing to the community. Um, you, you really have to get out there and know your community because storage customers, they're not going to rent with someone they don't know and trust and don't feel comfortable with. So you have to spread your brand around. A lot of, a lot of people say that branding doesn't really matter because people are just going to find a storage unit and roll up to it and move in. That's not really true anymore. Um, and it hasn't been for, for years, uh, in order for that customer to rent with you, they have to feel comfortable with you. Hmm. And, um, you can, Put that brand as much as you can out in the market so that they see it a lot. Um, school sponsorships are great. Little league teams and hold ho helping the Girl Scouts sell their cookies and every little thing that you can do to entrench yourself and become a valued and trusted community resource is what you need to do to get in good with your company or in your community so that when they need storage, because, you know, you can't put storage on sale. People don't come running to buy it. It's not that TV on Black Friday. You know, you got three TVs already, but hey, man, a 70 inch one is so cheap today. I'm getting yeah. that. Um, you know, so you either need storage or you don't. So when you need it, you want them to think of you first. And the way you do that is pushing your brand to the community. So, um, you know, we do special events on site to drive human traffic to the facility, because once somebody comes on site, um, we set up our events in a way that they are forced to kind of move through the property. They're forced to, even they're, even though they may not be paying attention at the time, they're still seeing your elevators, your loading area, they're seeing how the gate works, they're seeing if you have loading docks or whatever it is. And um, so we use those events to educate our community about 
what we provide so that they they can actually recommend with knowledge this self storage facility is great. I saw their you know great uh, freight elevators. They're able to you know, move great things, and um, or you could roll right up to the door and roll up your door and offload right out of your truck. You know whatever whatever your features and benefits are, um, we we highlight those with events. And I saw someone in the chat just now asked uh, what type of events we do yard sales, we do uh, customer appreciation events, we do car washes in areas where we're allowed to do car washes. Um, you can have uh, like a drive through Girl Scout cookie sale. Um, that's always fun. That's so fun. Time. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of events. If um, I don't know if you guys are able to reach out to me after the show, I'll be glad to share. I got like lists of, of things that can be done. Stacey, I think that that list would be really, really cool because we will make sure we add that to the show notes. Uh, sure. So, Hug yeah. team, if you'll uh, remind uh, us to reach out to Stacy. But on that, on, on the, you know, because we we've heard we've heard mixed signals from the industry, right? Like, don't host garage shells because what if someone falls and breaks their knee, or you know, don't have events where so many people come to your facility because of X, Y, and Z. So, like, what's the thought process behind that? Is that something to be fearful of? Uh, when and if not, how do I do it in a way that that protects me and my business? Well, you're. You should have good property insurance um, to cover. It's like homeowner's insurance. Somebody could fall on your staircase at home as easily as they fall, you know, at the property. So um, just cover yourself with insurance, market properly um, to drive people to it. You have to remember only about 10% of everyone who sees or receives an invitation to your event is even going to show up. So, but if you get 50 to 100 people on site at your property, that's another 50 to 100 people you've just added to your marketing army who can talk intelligently about what you offer. So every little one that shows up is it's great to have them on site. Um, I think you don't worry too much about that stuff. Plan your logistics, make sure you plan for vehicle traffic and foot traffic and make sure mm. they never intersect. You know, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's things that you do to, to make sure you are doing it safely. Be, be logical about it. So. And I, I want to expand on it because a lot of the REITs don't do this. You know, they're, uh, it, it's, they're, it almost feels like they're not allowed, you know, because they are afraid of the, you know, liability for it. And that's where you can set yourself apart is being a home, you know, name. So like shouting out to Kaylee, who's in here, she is now voted, she's less than a year old for, for the facility, and she's already voted for um, best storage in Laurel, just because of they did a tr trunk or treat and hey it ended up raining so they just brought in everybody inside and tons of people showed up people yeah. who don't have storage so it's you just have that free visibility you bring it in and you do what you can and you're going to be part of the community and that's what sets you apart from anybody else yeah that's think, awesome kaylee shout yeah. out yeah. Congratulations, you guys are really kaylee. you're really talking about that reputation management, right? I mean, there's kind of the get Google reviews, but managing the reputation of the, that old school marketing, like we might talk about a little bit later of just boots on the ground, grassroots stuff mm -hmm. is, is so essential. I love that you guys are returning and talking about that more because I think a lot of the uh, digital marketing can kind of get to be white noise. I mean, we're I'm very adept at clicking off the ad and fast forwarding the commercial and doing that thing. But driving by and seeing a facility doing that kind of stuff. That's really great to hear that you guys are doing that. Um, but as a digital marketer, I have to ask, what what digital marketing stuff are you guys pursuing that helps during these slow times? Is there an emphasis on uh, on, on Google ads? Are you doing more display marketing? Um, what, what are the kinds of things you're leaning into during this time? Taking lots of pictures. Uh, funny enough, so yeah, Google ads are uh, the top kind of thing, but you also want to be able to be posting anything. So any of those events that you guys might host, you know, make sure you're taking pictures. It's not something of like, oh, I'm boastful of, hey, you know, look what I did. It is look what we've done for with the community. And so just being able to, you know, just show that you are part of that community through your digital marketing, you know, throw in a Facebook ad out just to be like, you know, hey, look what we did. Our free truck was in the uh, parade, you know, and that just kind of adds a little bit extra for you that, oh, well, hey, by the way, they have a free truck and I just got pushed this ad showing that. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that completely. We, you know, pay per click uh, Google ads are pretty much everybody's bread and butter digitally. Um, that's kind of the norm now. But as as you said, Josh, it does kind of become white noise. I think consumers are getting a little more savvy about skipping over the ads at the top and going to the real search engine results below that. Um, so making sure that your content on your website is really deep and provides lots of helpful information. Uh, Make sure your FAQs are stacked in a way that it might get picked up in your search results. That's another big thing. Um, Pushing um, not just not only Facebook posts, but also Google posts for your stores. Um, Pushing reviews is always a big thing. Um, We post pictures of our people when uh, whenever someone refers a storage customer to one of our facilities, we pay them $50. They don't have to be a customer themselves. No expiration, no limit. Everybody gets a $50 check from Universal because mm. thank you for sending somebody our way. Every time somebody shows up to the property, and also the big key with this is we don't have we don't mail that check to them unless they're like in a whole other state, okay? So we make them come to the property that they referred to and pick up that check so the manager can take a picture of the person holding the check. And we actually, I may have one in here. Yeah, we actually, I got these done. This is crazy. Okay, so this is a chip clip. Okay, and I printed it upside down. Okay, and it says another happy referral reward. And you put this, you put your check in the chip clip. Let's see, here's a FedEx thing. This is not a check, (laughs) we'll pretend it is. So let's pretend that this, you know, FedEx number is your check account number. So they clip over it like that. So then they take the picture and the customer's holding this, you know, and it's nice, you know, check display, but it's covering their banking information. So you don't have to worry about, you know, those bad actors that are online that can steal your bank information. Um, And then we post those pictures of smiling, happy customers or or referral recipients with their, you know, referral reward check showing it's actually $50 made out to me, you know, and um, we actually, you know, make good on the promise. And it's proof of the pudding that yes, we will pay you for every single person you send our way. That referral word of mouth, it's lightning in, in a lot of markets. So they see there's so many cool wow. layers to that, right? I think yeah. the chip clip <laughs> on its own is cool, right? Like the, the, the functionality of covering my bank info to the marketing piece of like, hey, here's another swag item that has my name on it, right? Yeah. I think that's lovely to the delivery of the, the proof in the pudding, like here's a check, right? But then down to taking a photo of it. So that gives me the warm and fuzzy as the person receiving the check. But now you're talking about piece of content that is now you can put in all your various distributions uh, uh, channels. Yes. Like there's 18 layers to that. And I think that's yeah. so, so cool. Uh, and then David in the comment section, cause you, uh, you know, Stacey, you talked about uh, posting on Google business. Yeah, he said here, suggestions. No one in his market is doing postings on Google business. In fact, I would say less than 10%. In fact, Pug Pack, I love y'all out there, but you're not posting on Google Business. And I tell you about it all the time. It's easy, it's free, right? Yep. Uh, and the ones who do it can actually see that that that, that you you rank better. And Definitely. It, you know, it's it's a big, it's it's an easy thing to do. Uh so David, thank you for calling that out because I, I, I think that's really good advice. Um so, but I, I, I just love that referral strategy, Stacey. I think that's I if you if anyone's in this room taking notes. Borrow that word for word and step by step and, and, and go do it because uh, I think that's really, really cool. So talk to me real quick. What are some tactics that are like more experimental that you would say, you know, you may hear the gurus out there talking about these things, but it's not necessarily something that y'all do or it's not something that y'all are ready to like commit yet? Mm. I know a good one that I'm really, really perking up my ears about. Um, and I got it from Melissa Stiles over at Storage Asset Management. She's been doing some influencer marketing, um, which is really cool. Now, her her business model is different than ours. With our facilities, we're not one single brand. We have, you know, 72, 75 locations or what, whatever we are now. And I've got like 50 different brands. So it's not like I can be like, you know, go rent at Universal Storage because that doesn't exist, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a little bit harder for me to do some of the, the big mass marketing like that. But what she did, and this is great for any of you who all have the same brand, maybe look into doing this. Um, she reached out to um, her managers to see if they had anybody renting with them that was an influencer, a social media influencer. She found a couple of them. There were like two. Um, The first one she posted videos or she had that person post a video about how, I can't remember exactly what the person does, but something fashion or maybe even interior design or something, but she was talking in the video about, you know, and I use self-storage this way and it's great. 
the person did a second video where she was actually on site at the facility showing them how she uses um, self-storage and everything. They got like eight rentals in the first month off of that one video alone. Mm -hmm. And then they'd had another influencer in another market do the same thing. Um, I think that is just genius. And the beauty of it is it's all, you know, for these particular markets, it's all the same brand. So it's scalable for her whole brand. For me, it's a little bit harder because I've got one storage facility with one brand. And do I have an influence for there? I don't know, you know, so um, we'll have to figure out another way to do that. But I think, I think that was just phenomenal. That's cool. Heather, how about you? Have you, have you kind of, you know, I know I saw you in New Orleans. Um, uh, no, I saw Corey in New Orleans and for the, the SSA recently. And, you know, we got to see some of the the, the experimental stuff that people are trying. Have you seen some of that stuff and, and or anything that piques your interest? I, nothing yet. I mean, so um, in general, a lot of uh, some marketing things where um, like any of the AI stuff or for instance, like virtual, virtual reality, if I can say it, um, you know, the Google, you can actually, the Google, Google, you can do the uh, tour your facility. And so there's been some things like VR where you can just kind of walk through your facility. And I think that would be pretty great. We have some things where it's like, you can, you know, kind of walk through it like an open house almost. Um, and I think that will be much more prominent soon. Yeah, the 360 videos on Google, those are great. And, and you can cool. actually hire a, um, a local 360 photographer to come do it for you and uh, post it to your to your Google as well. Those are those are great, especially with larger facilities that have a lot of features and benefits to show. We have some facilities that have like conference rooms and business centers and, you know, like incubator offices where you have an actual walk up storefront business. And then behind that is a small little office and behind that is this giant storage unit and they rent the whole thing as as one whole piece so you know um elmwood self-storage yeah. <laughs> this that's is one of, that's one of my clients yeah <laughs> i know yeah. So, um but yeah you know if anybody's looking at the chat check on that it, it's it's pretty cool actually phenomenal that's a, that's a great tip heather thank you yeah so yeah, so i'll, I'll give ahead, a Josh. shameless plug for the podcast next week but something that we're we're starting to lean into a little more is cause marketing and partnering with um charities and causes and storage gives is the one that we work with a lot. Um, but we're going to be talking a lot about that next week. So if you're looking for new ways to reach your community, or like Tommy was saying, different uh, avenues or channels you haven't maybe explored, that's one to think about. And we're going to be talking about that next week uh, on the podcast. Yeah, that um, whole cause marketing, we've been, we actually have been doing that for a little while. I've partnered with, of course, with Storage Gives, with Storage Auctions, we've done that. But individually, as we host these on-site events, we always try to find a local charity or a local cause and create a fundraiser during that event, because um, that gives you extra brownie points with the community as right. well. Um, whether you're raising funds for the little league team to go to state or, um, you know, uh, raising funds for a charity, maybe you do you know, food drive. We, we always have food drives mm -hmm. in the fall and coat, warm coat drives and, you know, as well. So um, anything that you can do to boost your community. Uh, and it, I mean, it, charities in your community, they, they have needs. And if you can draw attention to it, that's really, really good, positive marketing. Cause mm -hmm. marketing is, is beautiful, helps everybody. You know, there's there's not a loser in cause marketing, period. Yeah. There's not. Well, speaking of losers. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Heather. And then <laughs> no. I'll talk with losers after that. <laughs> not you, you're a winner, so. No, I to expand on that, your local chamber of commerce usually has the best resource to find out what is needy. I'm going to keep throwing the chamber of commerce out there just because um, for Niceville, when they knew exactly what, um, you know, what kids were needy for Christmas. Uh, they brought us to the Bob Hope Village for uh, military, you know, hey, let's do this drive, let's get this done. And so that, you know, they have the best for any type of local charities that you can do. Yeah, Chamber's a great resource for, yeah. for all of that. Excellent. Okay, so here's my question. So speaking of what things that are maybe not working losers in the in the marketing industry are there any tactics that you've found that aren't working as well as maybe they used to in the last year or years that you've kind of 
shied away from that maybe were more important um anything you're or and, and anything you like brand new that maybe you're trying hmm. yeah um i would think at least for us we've um where we're at billboards and radio and tv don't necessarily always work for what we need uh we don't get as you know cost versus what we would receive versus um versus like google ads or our marketing facebook marketing things like that we don't get the same what we give into it you know, the return's well. not there yeah. yeah 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 i agree we we have really never done tv ads we've um, only done a couple of radio spots when we've had a live event like a, a live radio person at the event on an on-site event that works doing regular radio commercials doesn't really work uh, billboards doesn't really work that's a lot of money to put out there um, you can get some um, there's a company called blip billboards if you're interested in it they're the digital billboard company and you can actually go online and pick the billboards that you want and you'll get like i guess it's 30 second screen time on the mm -hmm. on the billboard and it is um, a lot less expensive than um, traditional billboard so it's something to explore if you have but you you need to go online and look at their mapping and see if you even have billboards in your area before you even right. you know, yeah. sign up for it but yeah. it's, it is a little bit less expensive yeah with billboards make sure that it is you know right next to your property you don't need something that's four miles away you know if you don't have any frontage you know visibility then a billboard might be better for you, but yeah. don't get anything that is too far that nobody's yeah. going to be like, yeah. oh, that's right there. Where is it now? Nope. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Always get a billboard when you, um, you always want to get one that's close enough to where you can say, if it's on a highway, you can say exit now, turn right, or whatever the direction is to get you there. There's been a couple of uh, places, Heather, you mentioned uh, low visibility from the street. There's been a couple of times we have had a billboard that was on the highway um, and, you know, you can't see the facility from where it's at, but, you know, we'd say exit now and have an arrow pointing, you know, go this way. Um, and that does help a little bit, especially for a new facility. Uh, once the facility, you know, became stabilized, got some age on it, and and we'd really done more um, community marketing so that people are aware of us, we kind of got rid of the billboards at that point. I love that. So I, I think like some of my biggest takeaways hearing both of y'all talk about this is like, there's no absolutes, right? I think they're like, some things work in some markets and some things may not work in other markets uh, or not even markets. It's just like the stage of your facility or where it was built on a plot of land, right? Uh, so so I think like those are so many external factors that you're having to weigh uh, that you, you know, any advice that you hear on Gap Focus or anywhere uh, at the, you know, self-storage associations and other uh, webinars that it's not, there's no absolutes, right? What what may work for Stacy's facilities uh, in California or Colorado may not work for Heather's in Mississippi. Right. Um, so so I, I love that that y'all are given all this perspective uh, and, and not saying, hey, here's the prescription, you got to go do it. There's no <laughs> uh, prescription. Yeah. No. Uh, so I, I really, really love that. So, so speaking of the differences, right? So specifically, talk to us what does marketing look like when occupancy is low, when you guys are leasing up, to when occupancy is high, when you all are stabilized? You've already mentioned one example where you may get rid of the billboard that was kind of necessary when you're brand new and establishing yourselves, but now you're established, right? So talk to us about the different marketing strategies and how marketing changes from lease up to stable. Oof. So for lease up, we put a lot on um, our Google ads, making sure our website is perfect, uh, Facebook ads, and then also things like spare foot. Um, that mm. It's going to give you um, the best visibility. Um, and then versus a, a facility that is more mature, that is more kind of honing in on finding out exactly if it's rural, finding out what local um what your manager thinks of that local area what they can get you know dig into and then if it's more urban making sure that you just find like the the best sports team you know because that kind of brings a, I don't know sports at all <laughs> I am wholly not good with sports but things like Louisiana you know they have uh saints I think <laughs> um but your manager knows what's going on in that area so that's they can kind of be like, hey, um, 
there's this great, you know, sports team that's going on and this uh, athlete came back home and he has a, a charity that's going on. And so we were able to donate to that. And then you kind of post that and that's more visibility for those sports fans who weren't thinking about storage before or had no idea what storage might be. And so just switching it from, you know, what works for something that's uh, a new lease up on that end of, hey, it's going to be kind of dependent on your area, it, it, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, and in a lease up situation, we are always going to hammer down on pay-per-click. We're going to throw a lot of money in that direction. We're going to make sure we've got them on spare foot. We're going to be giving away units, mm -hmm. you know, dollar move-ins, 50% off first three to six months, whatever it is, because the goal is to drive occupancy up. Once occupancy is up, and then you can start doing revenue management, increasing tenant rates, um, things like that to, to grow your income. Um, but as far as marketing and a lease up situation, it's a lot of digital goes out there, but also we, we like to go ahead as soon as the property is photo ready, like all the little kinks are worked out, all the signage is in place. Um, you know, everything is perfect. We like to have an event, a grand opening ribbon cutting. We get in touch with the chamber. They are happy to come out there with their giant gold scissors and a giant red ribbon. The photo op is priceless you, and they'll help you spread the word as well. And you'll get you know, a hundred people out to your property to witness this ribbon cutting. You give them some refreshments, some food. Don't forget your trash cans. If you don't give them a trash can to place to put their trash, they'll put their trash wherever they want. And guess who gets to clean that up? You guys. So always put trash cans. You want a hot tip on a trash can? Easy to do trash cans because trash cans actually are surprisingly expensive for big ones. So everybody has a small box, the 1.5 book box in their inventory. If you fold up the bottom, but leave the top flaps intact where they're connected on the top, it's perfectly um, fit for the 50 gallon big black like yard trash bags drop that sucker in there roll it over the edge instant disposable trash cans to put wherever you want also advertises the fact that you sell boxes so that's 23 what years oh. in self storage will teach you some <laughs> things i love that <laughs> well, well. So, um, so yep, yeah, yeah, but we host that grand opening event and, and take people on little mini tours of the property as well to show them what we have. Again, it's really yeah. important when you have events on site to get them to see everything. So it's a great introduction to the market um, in lease up. Now for stabilized stores, we're going to pull um, way back on pay-per-click. Uh, when we see occupancy getting really high anyway, uh, we pull back on pay-per-click because I'm not going to spend money to get people, you know, to come in when I'm pretty high occupancy. I've got other marketing tactics that I can do. And knowing also that I'm never going to outbid the REITs online. Yeah. So why am I going to fight with them when I've got high op occupancy to begin with? You know, I can manage my revenue and I can just kind of keep a good steady flow and still grow income that way by revenue management as well. Um, I just saw Tamara asked, uh, where do you get those fold up trash cans? What I was talking about are the boxes that you sell on site um, on in your property. Or if you don't sell boxes on site and you don't have the space for it, because there are facilities, you just don't have the room to sell boxes and supplies. You can go to like Home Depot or Lowe's and just get a small box. It's the 1.5 gallon or 1.5 cubic foot box. And it's a 50 gallon trash liner that that fits in it. And then you can throw it away, like if it gets gross or you can, you know, unfold it and keep it for the next time, whatever you want to do. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm curious, just um, who maintains all of this marketing stuff? Because you guys, you have multiple mm -hmm. facilities underneath you. Um, how much responsibility do you delegate to the, the property managers? How much are you checking stats all the time? H how is that delegated in your companies? So with my company, every store manager has a... a a spreadsheet basically it's a reporting spreadsheet that i created it's called the personal marketing goal or the pmg and they set up their marketing goals for the entire year and it lists out um you know uh the events across the top for the you know, like there's a column for each month of the year and the events that they're going to have each month they're listed across the top and then the types of marketing are down the side you know how many personal visits to businesses did you make because that's something that we do also every single month they're responsible to make at least 40 visits to the marketplace that's 10 a week you can knock out 10 visits if you break your marketing area in zones um so that you're only hitting one zone per week then you can like you know break it into four different zones and you're saving gas saving time making a route for yourself you can knock out your whole market um by zones pretty easily you can do 10 visits a week and then uh visits emails um social posts what's your social post reach you know all different kinds of metrics down the side and so 
that is turned into me to the marketing department um, by noon on the first of every month covering the last month. Um, so they need to send me their goals and, and it's all rated by percentage. How much of your goal did you achieve? And most of our stores are hitting 95 to 105% of their goal. So, and a goal is a goal. It's not, it's not the easy apples. I want the goal is push, push yourself. You know, that's why you set a goal. So. I love that. I love that. So no, no, Stacey, you were, you were dropping off some promos, right? During this lease up phase, you mentioned that y'all are uh, going to be a little aggressive because the name of the game is to, to, put some people in units, right? Yes. Uh, or people's things in units. What were some of those promos that you rattled off? And and maybe what are the ones that are the most effective uh, for a lease up scenario? Sure. So um, in a lease up scenario, we found most effective is that half off uh, first uh, two to three months. People always think that they're only going to need a storage unit for three months, you know, or whatever it is. Uh, we learned a long time ago that if you ask people when they're moving in, how long do you think you're going to need it? And if, if price comes into question, then you and they say, well, you know, so-and-so down the street has the same unit for only $80 and it, you're renting it for 90 And you could say, well, Mr. Jones, how about you said that you are going to only need this thing for six months? If I price match for your six-month term, you know, would you rent with me today? That gives them no reason to walk out the door and leave. Leave, and then after six months, jump that rent up to where it belongs, you know, um, but uh, price matching is a good tool. The 50% off first three months has been a real hot one for us for the last couple of years, actually, because they always think they only need it three months. Um, so that works really well. We find the dollar move in, uh, depending on the market, it doesn't bring in the desired clientele that you yeah. want. There's a lot of, you know, uh, drop it and ditch it kind of people that'll just you know, we had uh, one horror story in one of our facilities a few years ago. It was probably, I don't know, three or four years ago. Um, they were horrified to discover upon uh, auction processing when they cut the lock on these three 10 by 30 units is it, that this, you know, couple, like two or three people rented. They were all, turns out they were all in cahoots with one another. Um, they did the dollar move in and then never paid anything else. They had loaded these units full of used tires. Used tires. Do you know how hard it is to dispose of used tires in oh, most states? Yes. I mean, you have to pay for that. So it was absolute nightmare. It cost us a lot of money to get rid of those tires. So, um, you know, just be really careful with the dollar move-ins. This is also why it's really important to actually have a human on site who's kind of watching people moving in and out and making sure, you know, nothing weird is going on, or at least having camera systems so you can see what's going on. Because, um, you know, it is up to us to make sure that what's going on is a safe practice for everybody. Wow. So, so go, going back to Josh, your question, I think was really brilliant, right? I think maybe uh, you're trying to figure that out too, because you're overseeing 30, <laughs> 30 facilities. Uh, but Tanya in the comment section here, she says, hey, what about when there's only one marketing manager for 23 locations? Um, what's, the, what's the advice you got, Stacey? I got you, Tanya. Um, so she says you wish she could do 10 business visits a week. Let me tell you, if you're, if you can't knock out 10 business visits in a week, I, I, I'll be glad to help you. We can knock out 10 business visits in half a day because you don't walk in there and, and, start up massive convers lengthy conversations. You get in and get out. You got to get in, tell them who you are, tell them what, you know, give them a gift, give them a goodie, something, remind them that you pay them for their referrals. You appreciate it if they'd send anybody our way. So drop by anytime. I've got a neighborhood board where we, we put local businesses, uh, business cards on the wall. So bring your business cards over and, you know, we'll advertise your business too. But you know what? I know you're at work. So I'm just going to ask for your business card. I'll follow up. I'll send you an email later. Let me get out of your hair. You have a great day. Boom, out the door. You know, each marketing visit should take five to 10 minutes. Um, and if you're planning your route, if you're doing it in a zone and you're planning your route and you're planning it also by target type, like you're only going to visit doctor's offices on this particular zone for this month, um, then you can phrase your, your pitch, you know, hey, I know that you've got that patient room back there full of files. Once you bring those files to us so you can clear out that room, see more patients, make more money for the doctor, it'll pay for the unit itself. No big deal. You know, that. and when you, and hot tip too, when you're marketing to medical offices, never ask for the doctor. <laughs> Or the, you know, whoever it is that's running the office, ask for the office manager because it's that person's headache that you want to cure. <laughs> um, they're the ones who are dealing with this stuff. But um, 23 sites, I would, I mean, honestly, I think you could, if they're, especially if they're all local to one another and if they're all the same brand, market for all of them at one time, um, if you can. I would love to have just one brand to market for, man. You guys would know what I would be able to do with that. But um, 
Yeah, you could, I mean, you really can. I tell all my managers to never, ever, ever wait until your marketing day to get your stuff ready to go marketing. Always get it ready the day before and put it all in your car and get your plan and your route and everything. Um, have it all planned and get your goodies put it in your car and then don't even open the office, put a sign on the door that says, Hey, we're going to open 11 today. And at nine o'clock start marketing and making your visits and then go open the store later because the store can wait. That's, we, that's why we have a call center. That's why we have a website. We have, you know, QR code on the door where people can zap it and, and rent a unit online and move in themselves right now. So, you know, um, the marketing is more important at this point. So uh, get that done, get it done early and don't wait till the day of, because the thing is, if you wait till the day of, and you're trying to put together your goodie bags or figure out your route or whatever, the phone's going to ring, customer's going to come in, 10 things are going to happen. You're never going to get out the door. The point is to be out the door. So make it happen. Heather, Heather <clears throat> how do you do that with Space Fox? Do you, I, I don't know the makeup of your facilities, if they're mostly manned or if they're remotely managed or, and I know you physically, because there are so many different states, you aren't doing this, uh, just like I can't as well. And I'm, and Stacy isn't physically the one that goes to, to all of them. So how does that happen with with yours? What's delegated to the property managers? How, how do you handle that kind of on the ground marketing? So, yeah, it is. It starts at hiring the right person and training them to, you know, so that you have that manager that is excited to be part of this. It, yeah, sure, it's storage. Not a lot of people who just come from another um, type of industry come into storage thinking, oh, yeah, sure. But it is something the the type of people that work for storage, they want to be friends. And so, you know, you go to, um, funny enough, I, all of our facilities are manned. I do visit all of my facilities. Nice. And so it's, uh, it's a lot of miles driven, but it's, it's also really, really important of following up, you know, keeping accountability. And so the Stacy, what you have where like, they have to actually write down everything of what they've done. That's fantastic. It's, it's making sure you follow up. It's not just asking, hey, you know, did you do this? Okay, sure. But still, we're not having great uh, marketing going on. You know, uh, something's not right. You keep them accountable. You, not in the sense of, you know, you've done something wrong. Reward them. You know, hey, this is fantastic. You guys are doing great. Making sure that they're, if you're doing bonus systems, that that's going to help. Um, like, hey, this is how many Google reviews you've gotten. This was this was a fantastic five star Google review that you've gotten. This is great. You know, let's keep that going. You reward your managers because they're the ones who are there. So that's the face that it's almost that's the face of your business in that area. It it's is. not it's not me. You know, <laughs> I might be on a, a video here and there, but it is not me. I'm not the face that your manager is the person that you have to go for. So keeping them accountable and asking them what they want to do. You know, there's, it, you have no idea what can work in that area until you ask your manager. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Love that. Well, so we have some live q and I'm going to go ahead and throw those on. Julie asked, uh, hey, while business is down, do you still recommend raising monthly rental rates to existing tenants? Um. Yes, but with caution, mm. um, because what, what you'll really want to do is check your rental variances. And um, one of the things we, we do is uh, we, we raise street rates before we raise uh, tenant rates. So then the variance is a little more apparent. Um, and we really, you know, in slower times, we're a little more cautious. We do it uh, by percentage rather than dollar amount um, so that we can tell them, you know, we've only you, you were enjoying a 30% discount off of current street rate. I brought you to where you're still saving 15% off a of street rate, but I'm still, I'm increasing my rate as well, um, you know, just to get a little more money in the door. But you want to do a little less aggression um, during this, like, you know, when the business is down. So uh, instead of that 15%, you know, increase based on where they were, it might only be a 7% increase or something like that. But um, yeah, you, you still have the ability to, you know, cycle your, and, and work on the, the, biggest variances first, the people who are 30% less than street rate, you know, mm. sort, you can pull reports, depending on your management software, you can pull a report. Um, we pull a report that shows the rental rates by date last changed. And we cycle through and try to make sure everybody gets a rental increase every 270 days, which is 10 months, 11 months time frame. 
Um, so we're not hitting them every six months. There's a lot of REITs that are very aggressive hitting every, you know, six months with an increase. I, I think that's the wrong thing to do. Um, you're going to get a lot more bees with honey than you do with vinegar. So uh, <laughs> as we say here in Georgia, so um, yeah, but just, it's still okay to raise those rates. Just do it logically, go after the really deep variances first, and then um, kind of scale back from there. Got it. Another question just popped up. Thank you, Gardner. And thank you, Natalie. Uh, so Stacy, summarize for us, 30 second answer. What type of rental marketing goals do you set for property manager? Part A. Part B is how do you reward them for meeting their goals? Actually, I'd love both of y'all to answer that. We'll start with Stacy and we'll go to Heather. Okay. So marketing goals, like I said, um, we have a personal marketing goal sheet. So I want them to set their own goals. I want them to hit probably 40 businesses a month if they can, but it depends on their market area. I want them to look at the size of their email contact list and decide how many emails they're going to send out based on that. So on the email contact list, if you have 500 people in your contact list, I want to see if a thousand emails sent out for the month. That means you sent two blasts for the month. That's easy to achieve. I want to see um, at least, you know, 20 Facebook posts a month. So I know you're hitting, you know, most of the days. Um, we want to see the reach grow from there. Um, and then, you know, there's, you know, I want them to set their own goals, what's feasible for them, but pushing themselves to actually get out there and do it. And then um, how we reward them is uh, we have an awards banquet every single year at the end of the year. We uh, do it in February every year for the year prior. Um, they get goals based on what they've achieved there. If I see somebody's really kicking booty on the PMG and they're really like hitting 120% of their goal or something, I'm going to send them a personal card with a gift card in it saying, hey, you're kicking butt. So keep it up. And I, I believe in you and I appreciate you. That's amazing. Heather, how about you? How, what what kind of goals do y'all set at Spacebox? And then how do you reward the team? Like Kaylee, for example, for doing so good in Laurel. <laughs> so yeah, the, the goals itself, um, I don't have a set sheet. I might implement that uh, soon. But right now, it's kind of more free form of like, hey, you know, what do you think is going to work this year and like are you excited about anything that might be coming up is there some sort of county fair what you know what are you excited about and so that's kind of what I bounce it off of from there and most of the time it's hey you know are you going to your competitor tracking are you going and meeting are you networking and asking what have you done um, so it's a little bit more free form on that end but for a reward system, you know, we do fantastic bonuses and we also, um, we give promotions, you know, we always try to go promote from one within whenever we have like a new facility open. Um, that's how Kaylee got her facility. So it's, uh, I'm going to just keep boosting Kaylee here the entire time, but the, uh, you know, trying to give them the best bonus structure we have along with giving them raises. And then whenever I do go and meet with them, if I'm there, I take them out to a lunch or I take them out to dinner. And so I, I try to give that to them, you know, take them out somewhere fancy and I can, I can actually do that now for them and give them something that, you know, they don't have to spend money on themselves. They can enjoy and get whatever they need for a moment. So fun. I love that. I love that. It, it, all of that sounds great. And it's not like, it doesn't have to be lavish, right? We're not talking about thousands of dollars. We're talking about small gestures that are amazing for people. Uh, Josh, you want to ask that, uh, that uh, Ryan Matthews Q&A? I think that's a really good one before we head into the lightning round. Um, oh, Ryan Matthews. Sorry, gotcha. Okay. Um, basically, I think I'm going to summarize this here. If you can only afford to focus on on one area, if you don't have the budget to to do stuff all over the place with lots of, uh, you know, like what the REITs have with advertising for their their budgets. What's the one best area you can put your limited resources into? Your community, mm -hmm. flat out. People rent storage in a five to 10 mile radius. Focus on your community, get out there and get entrenched. That's the number one thing you can do. Ooh, love that. Heather, how about you? Yeah, it's, it's you know, it, you put it into your managers and just have them take pictures because them taking pictures doesn't cost anything. And so if they're out there, that's what they get. I love that. Those are great questions. I'll add my answer to that, Josh, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, your Google business, man, like it's free. It's like pretty good at reviews. All those photos that Heather keeps telling you to take, you put them on Google business. Uh, so Ryan, that's a lovely question. Oh, Stacy, go ahead. Uh, with your Google business profile too, when you're making posts, you can also shout out to the businesses that you've networked with in the, yeah. in the local area. They'll share it. You'll share it. It, it goes viral that way. It's nice. Amazing. Um, yeah. Well, y'all yeah. welcome to the lightning round. So, you know, you, it's uh, like, 
three o'clock already. Yeah, I, I know. I know. It's crazy. The, y'all have just had like, so much. We, we're skipping a whole section of questions, by the way. <laughs> so, we got to a lot. We got to a lot of them. We got to a lot of them. But, but lightning round, simple. So uh, we're going to give you five topics, and you're going to give us the 10-second answer. Uh, try. And so, yeah. So topic number, are you ready for this, Heather? Ready? Stacy, All ready? right. Josh, I'm going to throw you into the lightning round, too. I'm ready. I want to want, want get your take, too. So, uh, social media, go. It's a, a fantastic tool, and the more pictures, the more merrier. I agree with that. Social media is free. You don't have to pay for it. Um, don't let them talk you into doing ads. Yeah. Uh, and and post lots of photos. Uh, let your uh, managers go live during special events on site. That's a fun thing to do on social. Amazing. So Facebook, it sounds like that's when we're saying social. Facebook is mostly the the the, the platform, right? Ninety percent uh, of uh, American adults have Facebook. So yeah. Yep. Josh I, and I would media? add in, it's important, but it's not the most important. So okay. focus on the things that are the most important for your business, your signage, mm -hmm. your facility, your right. online stuff do it but don't do it at the expense of i haven't cleaned my building in a week because i'm working on pictures for facebook yeah make sure your foundation is solid before we start layering and some of this extra stuff uh lightning round item number two mailers direct mailers i throw them in the garbage when i get them usually <laughs> Uh, um, there's a program called Every Door Direct Mail with the uh, U.S. Postal Service. Go to USPS.com and look for the EDDM section. Um, you can blanket your market area based on zip codes and postal routes. Um, it's a lot less expensive than um, traditional postage. So um, you get a little more bang for your buck. They do have some requirements on size. Usually we do about a seven by 10 uh, mailer and put a special on it. You can do, you can get those printed with a perforation. So there's a coupon or a referral card on it. Um, it turns out to be a pretty good deal for us. Pretty good return on investment. Danielle, hope that answers your question. I was waiting for lightning round to ask your question, which was for direct mailers, what size do you recommend? Sounds like seven by 10, just because of uh, efficiency. Uh, Heather, any thoughts on mailers before we move on to the next topic? I haven't really used mailers. The association does and a little postcard is the best. There we go. Easy yep. peasy. And make sure you can measure the success. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, put a code on it to make sure you know where those people are coming from and put yep. that source code in your software. Track it. Yep. Uh, community sponsorships. I already know what Stacy's going to say, so we'll start with Stacy. <laughs> Uh, yes, do them all as much as you can afford. <laughs> there's there's no better marketing than than goodwill marketing. And uh, amazing, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah. um, as much as you can do, and make sure you take lots of pictures and post it. Love it. Yep, we do that a lot. Um, local high schools and sports are a big draw, especially in in smaller communities. So yeah, look into what where you're going to get the most bang for your buck, the most eyeballs on your on your brand, and and go for it. Yeah, try to see where everybody is on Fridays and Saturdays in your community yeah. and try to show up there. Mm, I love that. Like the flea market. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah. or the, the football game, if it's, a you know, the high school football. Do you need to put a big old banner on the fence? You know, figure yep. that part out. Amazing. Uh, referral programs. All day, every day. No expiration, no limit. 50 bucks pop. Sign me up with a bag of chips. Uh, Heather. <laughs> Yep, we love the referral program. We actually um, updated with uh, the store pass wallet and we have a little QR code that uh, they get 25 bucks if they someone scans their referral from their store pass. Josh, what about you guys at Affordable? Yeah, we do that too. We have a lot of uh, remotely managed. So we, we do the good old fashioned Amazon gift card that we send to people. But yeah, definitely do it, institute it, it works. Okay. Last but not least, this has been in the news quite a bit over the last three months. Uh, AI, so chat GPT, uh, chat bots, all those kinds of things. How is AI impacting marketing today? Uh, and what do you anticipate over the next 18 months? So AI is useful when you're trying to create some content, um, but you have to be really careful because Google is getting wise to that and they're picking up on the AI created content now and they will not give it as much relevance as organic content, um, something that you've created on your own. So um, use with caution. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's great as a helpful tool, but not to uh, replace anything. Right. Um, it's it's fun and it's interesting and I'm excited for it to what it'll expand upon. I definitely think it'll get used more and more and more, but it's, you still have to put that human element into it. 
Right on. Josh? Yeah, I would say don't limit it to, um, it, it is great for content. There is a ton of stuff that it, that ChatGPT and others can do for you. So do go take advantage of the free education that's out there to uh, be a good prompter for AI, um, because I, I think you'd be surprised at some of the different things that it can uh, help with uh, as a tool, not as a replacement, but as as a, as a good tool. Amazing, I love that. And, and hey, I know I know we're we're seven minutes past, but uh, Stacy, how y'all have a few a few more minutes for a few more questions because like they keep coming in. Is that cool? Yeah. Uh, so, so Carla asked uh, specifically about valet storage, which I think is a very specialty kind of storage, right? So I'm thinking like big cities, New York City, where someone's going to drop off a bin, you pull it, you fill your stuff up and they take it away into a warehouse, right? So her question is like, how do you go about um, making that appealing to customers using social media, TikTok? What, what platforms would, would you use to educate people on valet storage you know that actually would be a good case to use the influencer marketing um honestly i would i would get someone who is one of my customers to create some videos hopefully somebody who's got a pretty decent following online <laughs> you know but I mean, <laughs> if they create their videos you can still post it on your own channels as well this is how susan uses my facility you know uh to, for her valet storage with her business or whatever it is well, that's yeah. amazing doing a uh, kind of a, a mock move in and showing showcasing like how it is used and making sure like to kind of dissuade anybody's fears of hey you know is my stuff going to be um broken into or accidentally damaged and you just show you know you give that um sense of security of hey this is exactly the process of it happening and so that they have more knowledge and so you know it's kind of like an educational tool and then posting that, um, you know, posting it to your website. Uh, we did something for the Noki app, um, similar to that, just to show this is the app, you press the button and it unlocks and we open it easy peasy. So yeah. that's brilliant. I love that. that might be cool yeah. with that is to get a little GoPro camera and, um, you know, take a ride with your storage stored belongings and strap it to the box itself and show the, the journey of the valet, the item going through the valet process. That might be neat. Amazing. Carla, I hope that's helpful. And you and actually Carla had, had another good question here. And this is more of a technical uh question and probably more of an SEO related question. But uh talk to us about link building or uh recommendations on getting articles written uh that, that link back to your website. Stacey, have there any experience with those? A little bit. Um we actually have uh, been working with Lab Coat Marketing recently and they're writing some articles for our new website. Um, so we're creating our own content at this point, um, but uh, trying to link out to, you know, different uh, vendors or have them link back to me. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. There's there's a lot of vendors in the um, in the marketplace that can link back to me, but I'm a management company. So for self-storage, individual self-storage company might be a little different. I would work with moving companies and realtors and see if you can build some links that way. Love that. Yeah. Uh, Heather, any, any experience with link building on your end? Um, not in the sense of like, uh, like we've done some blogs and we're trying to get further into that, but I think, um, networking, going to your association that you can find, you know, somebody who does, uh, webinars or podcasts, you know, you can find more information from their websites that you can kind of help bring into your side of things. Yeah. So Carla, I know you, and so I know why you're asking these questions. Y'all are... Uh, breaking into a, a totally big market, right? So going from international to US is a big shift, right? And and link building is a great way to kind of build your own domain authority and, and building brand recognition, right? But in general, I would say that for local businesses, and actually there was a study that was done recently, that number of links back to your website is not as big a signal as it used to be because Google is very smart. Google knows that people are trying to get links back to your website. I'm not saying it's not a signal, but it's just not as big of a signal as it used to be. And then two, for local searches, there are way many other things that are relevant for local-based searches uh, than how many links go back to my website, uh, right? So reviews, photos, relevancy of the products, uh, those things are like top tier uh, compared to links. So while link building is a cool thing and it, you know if you can do it, great. Uh, it's uh, kind of like what Josh said earlier. It's something to add on after your foundation is built. Um, 
So love those questions, Carla. Um, the GoPro, by the way, they're great. Uh, was that you or Stacy? Whatever. That was a great idea yeah. uh, to just show the show the process and and kind of remove that fear and insecurity from it. So, uh, Josh, man, you've been a great co-host, my friend. Um, it's been fun, but hopefully Melissa will be back next time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I do have one last awesome. question. It's my question. It's question of the week. Uh, of all the things that we do in marketing. What's the most overlooked marketing tactic in self-storage? Your managers. Just plain and simple. You don't realize how much they affect your business. Um, they're the ones, they're the face. So if somebody, you know, if you have a bad manager experience, um, that referral, it's not just good referrals you'll get. You get bad referrals if you can't have a good manager. I'm thankful I have fantastic managers, um, and but that's how that's who we hire. Somebody who can be. It's not selling storage. It is like a concierge of a hotel. You know, there's you have to your facility is built. You know, it can sell itself. Someone's coming. They need storage. We know it, but they are the ones that will bring people back and be the best marketing you have. Yeah, I agree. Um, we hire for personality and energy and train for skill. They don't yeah. have to know self-storage, you know, and we find a lot of uh, former apartment complex managers make great storage counselors. Um, and we call them counselors because you're going to hear the life story of the person moving in. Um, but that person behind the counter running your facility, they, they don't always have to stay behind the counter. You want them to get out in the community. Um, I do think that person getting out and and befriending the community, proving that they're a good, trusted resource. That's the most overlooked tactic. It's very simple, um, and it makes a lot of sense. In the mm. Long run. Mm. Josh, how about you? Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Those what? are those are really good. I um, know, man. <laughs> so I, I don't know if mine is a tactic as much as um, know, know all the points on your customer's journey from like not knowing you exist to moving into the building to moving out. Because mm -hmm. um, if you don't know all those points, people might be missing you for something you, you – you have no idea that you're doing. It might be that the phone calls go into a weird voicemail. It might be that a link is broken on your website. Maybe you don't have a great manager. Maybe something's wrong at your physical facility. So if you don't know all those touch points, then you don't know what to check to make sure that everything is working smoothly. So I would say, even though that might not technically be with marketing, that is part of like just knowing the customer journey, all those different points that they, that they can connect with you. If the customer journey is not, Prime. If if that's not marketing, I don't know what is. That's, that's yeah. marketing. It, it <laughs> so, really is. Yeah. yeah think, so Josh, that love that answer, man. Yeah, yeah. Eliminate friction points. You know. Right. All and the way. Expect what you expect. Yeah. Well, y'all, what a what a fabulous show we had today. Uh, all of our attendees, if this was your first show, uh, first time at Gap Focus, I'm glad you were here. You chose a really good one to begin your journey. Uh, we had two of the best guests. So Heather and Stacy, what are the best ways for the audience to reach out to you in case they have additional questions? Um, and just want to get to know you because you're cool people. Um, you're more than welcome to, uh, email me or give me a call so we can always, uh, drop my information in. Um, I am more than happy to talk with anybody. And especially if you're in Mississippi, I am the executive director for Mississippi Association. So um, if you are not part of your association, you should be. <laughs> yes, you absolutely mm. should join your state association. It's a huge, valuable resource to you. It pays off. Uh, the return on that investment is is amazing, um, not only in terms of running your business, but also the relationships and uh, that you'll make with other people in your area. Um, feel free to email me anytime. Um, I'm sure you guys will include our contact information. You can Absolutely. email me. You can uh, give me a call. Uh, you can come see me at the ISS Expo uh, week after next. Um, you can see me at the Mid-Atlantic Conference um, in May. And then the Self Storage Association uh, Fall Conference in September as well. Yeah, so you can see Stacy everywhere. Uh, visa is taken. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes we do visa gift cards for the referrals too. I saw that question as well. So. Yeah. So incredible. Well, y'all, thank you so much uh, for for showing up uh, and sure. dropping some incredible knowledge with our community. Um, speaking of community, uh, join us on Facebook facebook.com slash group slash gap focus uh josh and tyler uh, code run that and lots of good conversation happening there all the past sessions are available storage slash resources and 
Gap Focus Podcast is alive and well. Uh, fun fact, Gap Focus Podcast episodes are about to outpace the live episodes uh, because Josh and Melissa bring on, uh, we do pop-up sessions or they do pop-up sessions and bring on amazing guests. Uh, so go check that out. And without further ado, our next session happening on April 27th, Revitalizing your storage business we're bringing on two of the coolest people and when it comes to like growing self-storage we've got adam steckler from storage mart speaking of growing storage like they've i don't know how many facilities they have now but it's a gazillion uh and drew pearson uh of pearson partners have grown his uh he's grown his portfolio so we're gonna talk about what happens when you buy a facility that needs a little bit of juice <laughs> uh or maybe you have a facility that you've owned for 30 years and it's you it's, you haven't focused on it and and haven't given it the love that it needed. Uh, so we're going to talk about that next month, April 27th. Uh, so show up Thursday at two o'clock. Y'all, thank you so much. Josh, seriously, man, lovely co-host. I'm excited to have Melissa back next month, but I'm glad you were able to yeah, jump in. It was fun. Great, great guests always help. So. Yeah. Heather, thank Heather, you. Stacy, thank, thank you. We'll see sure. y'all at Thanks ISS in a few weeks. Yeah. Take All care, right. everyone. Much love, y'all. Thank you.